yeah, thank you, Bridie and Louise and uh, everybody at uh, Full Circle. It's been uh, great so far. Um, Brussels is a city which I've been to once before. Kind of, I was whisked into a meeting and whisked out again, which is, I'm sure, most people's experience of this city uh, from a, a, a tourist perspective. Uh, so it's great to be able to spend some time here. So thank you for the wonderful um, reception so far. Um, yeah, as Bridie said, my name's uh, Ollie. I am a, um, a lecturer in human geography at Royal Holloway, a University of London. Um, those of you who know London might not know Royal Holloway. It's, a, it's actually not in London at all. It's actually out in Egham, which is the other side of Heathrow Airport, and um, which is very surprising for a lot of... Uh, when we have um, primarily sort of the foreign students, they get out of the taxi and they sort of look around and go, this isn't London, this is far too leafy, and the building is like Hogwarts. It's extremely kind of... Um, if anyone's seen the Founders Building at Royal Holloway, it's an extremely beautiful building and worth, worth a visit alone. The rest of the campus is boring and horrible. But um, Anyway, so um, that's where I'm from. Um, and uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, I was... Um, the book really is uh, a culmination of around about a decade and a bit worth of work in and around uh, the creative industries, uh, creativity, the creative economy, the creative city, and looking at how that term has been used over that time. Um, after I finished my PhD, I worked for a think tank called the Creative Industries Observatory, which was based in London, and it was designed really as a part of a wider project which was looking at business development between London and other parts of the world in China and India. And so um, it was, I was sort of in the academic engine room, if that's the right phrase to use, generating data and surveys, but very quickly it became a lobbying exercise. And I spent a lot of time in the Treasury Select Committees and lobbying for tax breaks for computer games industries and trying to get runaway production from Hollywood shot in London and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and it was, um, you know, it, it was around sort of 2005 to 2008, roughly, at a time when the creative industries were really big business. Uh, it just off the back of um, the newly um, identified creative industries task force in the United Kingdom, which was... Uh, helped create the departure for culture, media and sport based out of essentially a new Labour government uh, at the turn of the century. And I'll, I'll get on to all of the, the sort of historiography, if you like, of the term as we go through. Um, so really, uh, I did that for a bit and then became slightly disillusioned with the whole process and decided to scuttle back into academia uh, and obviously eventually getting a, getting a job at Royal Holloway. So just to sort of foreground a lot of this stuff that I do, um, you know, a lot of academics will have a slightly... Uh, distant view, perhaps, of uh, the subject matter, let's say, or you know, perhaps an objective distance. I have actually sort of been in the thick of it for a, uh, um, a relatively uh, uh, large period of, of my working career, I guess. Um, so anyway, so I'd like to start off um, really just, well, I'm going to just go through some of the overarching ideas of the book. Uh, in the discussion later, I think there's uh, time to discuss some of the uh, questions that it raises, perhaps, and some of the answers to those questions, which um, are very difficult answers, I think, to find, uh, but answers which I think are going to be increasingly important to find uh, as we go through some of the uh, you know, problems that we see looming over the horizons of this world, not least climate change and, and the rise of fascism and everything else. So uh, I think the discussion, I want to sort of, uh, perhaps we can get into some of those uh, deeper discussions, but I just wanted to sort of give an overview of what the book does and sort of where uh, where I've got to in that thinking and why I, you know the title is, is I guess as provocative as it is. Hopefully by the end of it you'll uh, understand why that title came about. So, um, but I'd like to start really with uh, an anecdote. I'm going to use the one. If you've read the book, uh, then you'll know which one I'm going to talk about. But it's the one that opens the uh, the tirade really. And it was back in 2012, uh, about February time. I was in New York City. I was at a major geography conference and I was coming out of a bar uh, at around sort of 2.30 in the morning, having just um, spent some time the, that evening um, seeing We Will Rock You, the, the big you know, mega musical, um, which a friend of mine really wanted to see. We were both kind of rock music fans. So we went along and it wasn't very good, I don't recommend it, but that's not the point. Uh, at about sort of 2.30 after a couple of bars, we, uh, a couple of beers sorry, in the bar, we um, spilled out onto the streets, obviously not many people are there, and suddenly we were accosted by a, a man who, wearing a very sort of um, uh, ill-fitting Ill bomber jacket, had a beanie on, clearly a homeless guy. And, um, you know, as 
most of us do when accosted by someone who is homeless begging for money. We tend to kind of turn away and try and exit the situation as quickly and as efficiently as we possibly can without causing any offence. So I, you know, me and my friend Phil, we tried, uh, started doing that. But all of a sudden, he broke into song, he broke into, and he had the most amazing voice. And uh, like I say in the book, I can't quite recall the exact lines, uh, but it started up, don't be bashful, don't be shy, don't be afraid of this homeless guy. And he went on to tell a story about how he wanted to become a musical star, a star of the stage and screen, and how he needed the money in order to get him there to pay for classes and, and everything else. And it was very funny. It was, you know, um, it was comedic, it was uh, showmanship, it was, it was everything you'd expect in a, in a kind of creative um, performance, except this guy was homeless. And of course, I started fumbling around in my pockets looking for all the money I had. I thought, great, this is amazing, here you go. And then on we went. Now, I didn't think much of it back then, but as I was kind of mulled it over, I was thinking, well, this guy was being very, very creative, wasn't he, right? He was using the, clearly the very, very good um, and um, amazing talents that he had to try and extricate money in order to survive, or at least, you know, as the story goes, trying to get, you know, thrive. Uh, and he was doing it in a way that is, um, you know, repeated in many, many uh, stories that we hear, the rags to riches stories of a person down on their luck, but in possessing a really unique, uh, innate, brilliant, unique talent, and works their way upwards and becomes a star of the stage or the star of whatever field they, they choose to go into. So I was thinking about this, situa this situation, this guy, and uh, I thought, well, this is being very creative, wasn't he? Um, but then I thought, well, they actually, no, the answer is no. No, he wasn't being creative at all. He was very talented, absolutely. He was an extremely talented guy. But was he being creative? Well, I did some research uh, and I found out that um, as, uh, as recently as last year, uh, th this person is still performing in exactly the same way. So it, for the, um, there was a couple of Instagram posts which I found and Twitter um, tweets which indicated that this person was still out there on the streets of New York City performing this little skit. Now that says one of two things. Either that this person has um, passed this thing down, passed this uh, performance down to other people who are homeless as a, as a good way of getting money, or that this, this, this guy is still out there on the streets of New York City performing this jig in order to try and survive. Now, in either condition, in either one of those things, it suggests that that you know, that isn't a creative act because it, it, it forces people to maintain themselves in a situation which is pretty destitute, i.e. living rough on the streets of one of the richest cities on the planet. So this guy has been repeating this act every day over and over and over again for five years, maybe even more. So was he being creative? Was he actually managing to change his situation? The answer is clearly no. And so what it struck upon is that this idea of creativity, and this obviously linked back to some of this, the other ways in which it's been banded around in policy, and that we are told by governments, by business leaders, educators, university lecturers, teachers, parents, advertisers, even our, you know, our friends and our family, they say, be creative and everything will be okay. That's how we progress as a society, is we need to be creative. If you can just find that talent that you have inside of yourself, that kind of inner entrepreneur, and you can release it somehow onto the world, then everything will be great, and the world will be a better place and we'll progress as a society. But what that word creativity and being creative does these days, and at least, and it's increased over the last few years, is that it doesn't do anything other than actually maintain the status quo, maintain the same systems of uh, oppression, if you like, that caused that guy to be homeless in the first place. It creates the same kinds of systems that mean that we are now looking at the creation of things like zero hour contracts and uh, payday loans and all these wonderful financial innovations that just keep people locked into lifetimes of precarity and debt. We've got things that are creative, um, where we look at creative cities, 
that you know we can think about the creative city as a new kind of way of thinking about how to zone or develop or plan cities that are creative. What do they do? Well, essentially, they just mask existing forms of gentrification, displacing people from uh, house, uh, from social housing, uh, and all the various. Um, you know, I try to have to rehearse the uh, the problems that gentrification has, and um, even within things like our political narratives, we are told to be creative. But essentially, what that means, particularly if you think when you link that to austerity, that being creative actually means just replicating the systems, uh, usually social services, that have been slashed, have been cut due to austerity, uh, largely Im imposed because of the financial crash. And things with our technology as well, you look at some of the things that are produced and the, the, um, uh, the, the way in which we are seem to be marching towards um, the enslavement of the human race by artificial intelligence. <coughs> Um, all these sorts of uh, machine learning and algorithms and artificial intelligence are creative. They're told that they are creating new ways of living, they're creating new ways of managing the planet and creating sustainable life, uh, sustainable agriculture, and they can even predict earthquakes. Some of the people are working on AI on predicting earthquakes. Now, you know, is that creative? Well, some of these things are obviously extremely important things that we're going to need as the human race progresses. But, you know, a lot of them are being forged in the fires of extremely wealthy trillion dollar corporations where their application will be anything but democratic. If you look at, you know, you only have to look at what Elon Musk is doing. You know, he's sort of creating a, you know, this sort of uh, gateway to the heavens. And when the earth does suddenly, you know, when climate catastrophe hits, do you think that we are going to be able to afford a place on that rocket to Mars? I'm not so sure. So essentially, the technology that's being created, you know, it has all this wonderful kind of um, applications and potential benefits, but it's being guarded, if you like, or almost kind of um, commandeered within a kind of private discourse. And it's just replicating those same problems of inequality and everything else that goes with it. So for me, and for some of the um, ways I've been seeing the, word, the way in which creativity is banded around, all it does is that on a, on a societal level, is really just replicate the existing systems that have created the problems that it was trying to address in the first place. It doesn't solve any of those issues in the longer term. So what I try to do is to think about the ways in which creativity has uh, been used in those different realms and then offer solutions or at least some examples of the ways in which people and different kinds of communities are um, enacting a particular kind of radical creativity or a creativity which goes against the prevailing discourse of, of our time, you know, a kind of capitalist version of creativity which just means capitalism's growth, essentially, or the, the spread of capitalist and neoliberal ideas around the world. So that's kind of what I've uh, been thinking about. So when, it, when, it's, when I say against creativity, I'm not against us being creative individuals or creative communities or creative ideas. It's far from the case. What, I'm, what I am against is this hijacking of the word creativity to mean replicating systems which are unjust, which create rampant precariousness, um, the emboldening of global fascism, climate catastrophe, and all the other ills of this world that we see marching towards these horsemen coming over this horizon. So I think that what we need to do is redefine how we think about creativity, redefine what we mean when we say creative. What is it that we are trying to create? Are we trying to create a new product that the market has deemed necessary, like a new computer game or a new piece of art or a new, um, uh, you know, a, a new piece of um, climate engineering which sucks carbon out of the air? These things are important and they're wonderful and they are great to consume. But they're couched, they are created in a system which will eventually replicate the, the inequalities in the world that we see around us. What we need to do is redefine those creative acts to, to feed systems which don't replicate that. And that is essentially what the book is trying to argue. And I can go through lots of different examples about where, they, uh, where those kinds of institutions exist. And when I say the difficult questions that we need to answer is like, how can we scale those up? Where can we... Uh, imprint those more just and more sustainable versions of creativity to 
benefit more and more and more people, which we will, we will need to do as, as, the, as the years roll by. So I think we've got 12 years, haven't we? That climate report that was released earlier this year or this month, we've got 12 years apparently. Sorry? Three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. Well, there we go. So uh, we've got 11 years and 48 weeks to, to think about ways in which we can change the system. And, you know, and a lot of the UN reports and the various other kind of institutions that, uh, that have fed into that report um, and the climate scientists and all the other people that support it, you know, they all agree that actually the current system of you know, rapacious capitalism is not going to be the answer to this problem. And so when we say creativity as it's currently defined to us, for me it just replicates capitalism. We need to think about creativity that goes beyond that. So it's not thinking about creativity from a psychological or neurological perspective. It's not thinking about creativity necessarily from an artistic perspective, but I think I'd like to think about creativity as a social uh, characteristic. So first of all, let me, I'll just sort of break down the, the various kind of realms. So the first one, uh, thinking about work. So creative work, and now we all know roughly kind of what creative work looks like in the, in the contemporary age. Um, you know, we have people like uh, Richard Florida, who the, uh, the American urbanist who wrote The Rise of the Creative Class back in 2002, and people like Adam Grant who talk about the originals, and lots of other usually white men from the States or from a, the UK say, well, this is what creative work is, right? And, um, you know, it's, uh, Richard Florida is very clear that the creative class makes up about one third of the American workforce, although exist other um, studies have replicated that statistic in many other parts of the world. And that everyone's, everyone's creative, but only, there's, a third, there's about a third of the population, the working population, who are able to make money from that. They're lucky enough to be able to make money from their creativity. And, you know, he, he says academics are creative, obviously. Um, you know, but, you know, healthcare professionals, advertisers, sculptors, and, he, you know, lists the, the, the usual... Uh, occupations that we consider to be creative. And then if you think about what creative work is, it's the ability to be flexible with that, it's the ability to maybe take a day out of the office and work in a cafe or work from home, maybe take a couple of hours off in the afternoon to go for a run or have a nap. You know, Google have sleep pods, don't they, in their offices. You know, the, the, the workspaces often have ping pong tables and foosball tables. This classic kind of hipsterish version of what the modern workplace should be like. Now, these are great, and I'm not saying that we should revert back to a kind of cubicle, William White sort of organisational man style of, of, of work, but what, the, what that particular motif and aesthetic of work enables is the erosion of, well, first of all, the erosion of any kind of um, uh, s safety net to a certain extent, because when you think about, creativity is often used as a pseudonym for flexibility. And to say, well, maybe we don't need to employ you on a full-time contract with expensive maternity pay and pensions and social security. Maybe we just employ you on a kind of part-time outsourcing basis. And then maybe, if you're going to answer your emails on the train on the way in, maybe we'll reduce your working by one hour a day because you'll do all the answering of your emails on the train. In fact, maybe we won't bother like building a, a, an office for you where you have to, you know, pay expensive rent and you know we have to pay migrant cleaners below min living wage in order to clean it, you know, you can work from home. And so maybe actually, maybe you don't, we don't need to, you know, actually pay you at all. Maybe we'll just pay you in reputation. Maybe you working for us is actually great for you as a, as a freelance designer. You know, we might be a multi-billion dollar advertising company, but we can't afford to pay you the 50 quid we owe you for doing that. And I've, you know, these are, these are real stories which, I've, you know, I've heard. So we all understand that this is creative work. So, it's, it's creative in, in, in one aspect, but that aspect really is just about making us more flexible, more agile. Now, again, don't get me wrong, this, is, this has allowed many people to, you know, um, single mothers, for example, be able to um, balance uh, work life and home life. It has created flexibility in which um, many people have been able to actually get work as when perhaps they wouldn't otherwise. However, Again, that is usually based in some sort of aspect of, of you know, mobility or social privilege. You know, I ask this to my students, I say, how many of you are on zero-hour contracts? And a lot of them are. 
And they say, oh, it's great, because it means I can fit it around my lectures. It's like, well, okay, great, that's fine, but you have geographical mobility. You probably have quite deep pockets, you, you know, for someone who goes to university in deepest Surrey, right, in one of the richest parts of the world. And, you know, you uh, have a sort of... Uh, a social sort of, um, uh, you know, social status, which means that you're not necessarily, um, uh, you're not going to be um, underprivileged, if you like, by uh, certain other structures. <laughs> so, so yeah. So, um, like for example, you know, you, you, if you're if you're a woman or a person of colour, or if you're disabled, you will often find that you know working these. You, you are, will face institutional racism, sexism, ableism, even before you've managed to get to that flexible working space. So when people, there's, a, there's an argument to say that, that the flexibility privileges people who are already in a position of power, I guess. So, so this, this creative work really is just you know, a kind of uh, a way in which to make people more flexible and more precarious. And what that does is it obviously uh, benefits the employers. It means they have to pay less for security and everything else. And essentially, it is creative work for the benefit of the existing mode of sort of capitalist Marxist labour relations. So, creative work in that respect isn't creative at all. So, what other things are there? Well, in, I'd like to sort of think there are lots of other examples out there which we might not think about as creative work, but actually are. So, like the NHS in the UK. Now, you may be well aware that it's under increasing uh, spotlight at the moment. It's being used as a political football all the time, not least in the Brexit negotiations. You know, it's been kind of dangled in front of Trump's face as a carrot to, um, you know, he can pillage it after the, uh, we crash out. Anyway, let's not go down Brexit. But, um, so, the NHS. Now, um, people don't think of it as a creative space. But if, when you think about what the workers of the NHS do, they, are, they work in a communal way in so far as they are not, uh, there is no direct mediation between the work that they do and the, the, the sort of profits of their employer. Their wage is already paid through the taxation system, so there is, you know, there, there is no kind of incentive, if you like, to, to get extra profit for their employers. I mean, in some instances there are with the middle management, but it, at its core, the NHS was set up as a sort of very communal labour, and the same with many other public services. Now, if you look at what Richard Florida says about creative work, he sort of says, oh, these people work extra hours, they love their job, they, they don't really see it as work, you know, they, they often take, you know, breaks to sort of um, um, encourage creativity in other parts of like, so they go for a bike ride and they come up with an idea and then they apply it to work. These are the sorts of things that the, the NHS workers and staff are doing and the firemen that went into Grenfell and everything else. But they're doing it with the ethos of, you know, the, for, a, for a communal public good. Now, it, you know, it might be less true than it was, but, you know, the NHS workers still adhere to an ethos of public service. I know many people in the NHS uh, who are very, you know, stri you know very, um, adhere very, very strongly to the idea that the NHS is a public good and they, and they, are, they are doing this work for the betterment of um, public life. And so that's, you know, I guess an example for me of, of a way in which to create... And now clearly the NHS is under attack in all sorts of different ways and it's been chipped away by private enterprise and there's all sorts of different issues now where we've got CCJs and um, community nurses are a thing of the past and sort of all care has been outsourced and it's very, very problematic and it's kind of been infiltrated in lots of kind of um, neoliberal and capitalist ways. So I'm not denying that it's problematic in that respect. But I think that at its core it has very creative ideas. But we can go further than that. We look at things like the Recuperadas movement in Argentina in 2001, which rather, when, when after the recession in Argentina, when the factories closed, rather than simply, um, you know, uh, getting the union to sort of uh, replicate what was already there, they defenestrated the union and they, they went back into the factories and actually got, you know, fired their bosses, well, got, you know, the bosses got rid of them all and actually just went back into the factory and just started working. They didn't bother about wages at that stage, they just went back in and they reclaimed the factory and actually just went back to work. And they fired their bosses and they had a much more equal pay structure. 
a very, very flat pay structure. They had a democratic system of governance that was done via sortition, uh, where they just sort of picked people uh, um, not uh, yeah, at random to sort of uh, for short periods of time to you know, have a sort of um, a government system uh, that was far more democratic. Um, so there were and so these sort of cooperatives are quite radical, but they're far more. Uh, different and just, I guess, insofar as they're more equitable and more transparent, they're far more democratic. And the Mondragon um, uh, Corporation, you know, clearly it's a multi-billion dollar corporation, but I mean, you look at the university, which I do quite a lot with envious eyes for many reasons, but one of which is, again, they have a very flattened pay structure. The people at the top only get paid three times the amount of people at the bottom. Uh, departmental expenses, if any of you know anything about the university sector, departmental expenses are extremely kind of political football, but they're completely open. You can see exactly who's, you know, claimed for what across the university. And um, when you've worked for the university for two years, you buy into it, you buy into this estate, which you can then take out upon, on your pension. And again, the management structure is senior staff as well as students and cleaners and everything else. So, um, you know, looking at that through the lens of the UK uh, university structure, which at the, of late has seen the vice chancellors pay being the serious of very, very, um, you know, uh, they get paid huge amounts of money essentially, and it's beginning to, uh, people are beginning to kind of question why that is um, because they're not running it into the ground to some degree. But let's not go down that route. But there are options, there are, there are examples of these kind of cooperatives that are enacting very, very different modes of labour, very different ways of organising work, which does away with this kind of flexibility of this faux kind of creative, flexible, precarious nature of work. So, um, so there are examples of these, of these things. Um, I don't know how much time I've got left, but um, oh, okay. So, one example I wanted to really um, talk about is it kind of cuts across the idea of the creative city and also creative politics as well. They're kind of changing the way that we think about these things. I'm not sure if any of you know about the city of Chiran in Mexico. That um, in 2011 there came a sort of crunch point. Before that, they had uh, lots of problems with. Um, a crime syndicate that was around uh, the illegal logging of um, forests around this, this area of central Mexico. They had very problematic crime rates, um, low, uh, massive youth um, unemployment. Um, you know, uh, it was pretty pretty nasty kind of place to be, really. Um, you know, gang and drugs problems and all sorts of things. In 2011, the uh, local community uh, led actually. Uh, led by the, the, the women's group, the women's kind of leading coalition, um, they uh, managed to, what they did was that they, first of all, um, got rid of the local politicians. They said, your, your power is no longer, um, you know, you're no longer in charge here. They, did, they, they um, uh, didn't do any local elections. They didn't, they didn't partake in local elections. They don't partake in presidential elections at all. Political campaigning is strictly banned in the, in the city. You can't drive into the city with any bumper stickers on your car, for example. Um, they then got rid of the police. Uh, they then took that on themselves. And in so doing, they were able to completely get rid of the loggers from the, um, from the area. Uh, and they began replanting the trees uh, and um, you know, maintained a sort of uh, a citizen police force. Now, that was 2011, 2018, there's, there's been some suffering about it um, recently, and the crime rates have dropped significantly. They didn't partake in the most recent presidential election. There is still no political campaigning allowed, but the quality of life has gone through the roof. Uh, children, uh, youth unemployment has dropped massively. The crime has gone down, and it's just, the quality of life has dramatically improved. And people, there's lots of stuff been written about, is this an example of a city-wide rejection of you know political um, the current political kind of accepted norms, i.e., kind of uh, voting, government, and uh, you know the, the standard kind of democratic parliaments that we see. So, and there are other examples of, of uh, smaller ones that there are in, in Bolivia. The school system, for example, they don't have school president, they don't have class presidents, and everything like that. It's all done again via sortition. It's all done via people drawing lots. And again, in Chiran as well. Sorry, the uh, the government is done via, via sortition. People have a period of uh, six months, but they are chosen at random to serve. You know, and if, I think if sortition is good enough for our justice system, why is it not good enough for our 
government system. And you know, you only have to look at some of the decisions that have been made, particularly for my immediate circle in Whitehall, to think that actually there are m probably 99% of the population that could do a better job than what they are doing at the current present moment in time. I mean, they are just ridiculously underqualified for what they're doing um, at the moment. Um, you know, I think that we had a recent the government recently appointed um, a minister for suicide. And it was found that you know they made jokes about suicide like two or three years ago on Facebook, and they'd made jokes about well, people can just go and jump off. I mean, we're talking that level of incompetence. So, you know, being creative with our politics. What about sortition? What about other ways of organising society? Why don't we think about our, our government systems that are put in place with their own demise as part of their policy? Why can we not think about a government which is? trying to organise societies that the government is no longer needed. What, you know, what about these kinds of things? Well, these just aren't on the radar of kind of mainstream thinking. And like I said at the beginning, with the way that the world is going at the present, I argue that they're very soon going to have to be. So, yeah, I'm not against creativity. I just think we need to redefine what creativity is. We need to think about trying to reach impossible worlds and thinking about how we can make them a real possibility um, today. Uh, thank you. I'll leave it there.